All right. So welcome everybody to El Tolbar Escalite Lynn Design Special Interest Groups uh, webinar. We have my co conveners Kashmira and Keith who will join us today to um, to present our webinar with our special guests. So we do our monthly webinars. Uh, we've got a brilliant LD hackathon series of events coming up, which we would love to get more registrations and also promote that as well. And just um, just a quick note, we do have our Ascolite uh, premier event coming up in New Zealand as well, our conference down there on December um third to December 6th as well. Now, moving forward, now, before we get started, um, we do would like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners and Indigenous cultures within Australia. And on behalf of the Lynn Design Special Interest Group, um, at the moment, you know, please feel free to acknowledge country um, and the lands and waters in which you currently reside in, in our chat. And we do pay our respects to our elders past, present and emerging and extend that to all who are here today, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. All right. Now we have to get in contact and to collaborate and connect with us and to our brilliant group of uh, learning designers and educators and those who are passionate in learning design in general, feel free to register and also to connect with us on LinkedIn. We're a beautiful collegial group. We have um, building valuable connections. There are a series of events. We have subtle activities, sharing of practices insights and really um, opportunities, job opportunities across the Australasian region as well. So I believe we're at 700, 800 plus at the moment, but we are keen to grow this bigger and more globally as well. So we're a collegial group um, really looking at to share, practice and promote the field of learning design going forward. So please feel free to join us in that space. We're all learning and working together. All right. now. We're towards the end of our um, LD Hack um, series of activities. This is based on our uh, feedback from our members within our learning design SIG that we wanted a hands-on collegial space to support each other and build capacity in the area of learning design. Our boot camp or learning design activity on LD Hack is actually coming up next week on Friday the 27th. It's between 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. It's hybrid. Uh, hosted in Melbourne at the Latrobe University City Campus. We will have Rob Ross and his team um, at the event providing hands-on activity. So you will get to play with the um, escape rooms and see that in action next week. We will have a session on online uh, design and scalability and quality um, and also Indigenous perspectives, embedding that into the curriculum as well, as well as an afternoon activity working together to solve wicked problems. So bring in your problems, your examples, you will have an opportunity to work with peers to be able to problem solve your issues as well. So we'll be working together, building connections. So please feel free to register. We have a lot of, still still have um, some places available on our Melbourne um, hosted campus, but I believe we may have sold out or maybe there might be an opportunity to open a bit more places online as well. But we've been very popular with our online space, but our um, on campus in person, uh, we still have uh, limited spaces left as well. So please feel free to register and also um, get in touch with us. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome Robert Ross, who's an Associate Professor of Engineering and Head of the Robotics and Electronics um, Department within La Trobe University, which is based in Melbourne, Australia. Rob's an award-winning, um, Australian award-winning um, educator uh, and has won multiple Vice Chancellor Teaching Awards as well. He's a pioneer in uh, designing educational escape rooms um, across the globe and also across various disciplines in that space. But without taking his funder away, I'm sure Rob will be able to give us more information about the work that he does in terms of designing that um, for active learning as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides and I'm going to hand it over to Robert. And I would encourage everyone here, feel free to engage with us in the chat and also feel free to connect with us and also Rob as well. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Leanne, so much for that introduction. And 
Uh, as Leanne said, if you've got questions, throw them in the chat. We'll have a bit of time for questions at the end so we can address some of those questions in the chat as well. Uh, but today we'll be talking about educational escape rooms for inescapable learning, trying to create this environment within education where students want to learn and really strongly motivate them in there. And so one of the things that we're trying to address in this talk is engagement in the classroom. And some of us have, well, I think all of us at times have either been in the classroom or taught in the classroom where engagement hasn't been the, the highest priority or people just haven't been glued to what's going on and really strongly engaged in it. And what we're trying to do is lift up that level of student engagement. Sometimes there's some of those things, some of those factors that we have control over as educators, but some things we don't have control over. We don't have control over what's going on in the students' home lives or what they're thinking about in terms of their boyfriend or girlfriend or anything like that. But we do have control over how we present information and how we actually engage students with that information. So they're the sort of things that we'll be looking at in today's session. Um, you've probably seen at some point in time the, the cone of learning. And if you've seen it, you probably know that uh, these um, numbers associated with it are pretty inaccurate. But this an intuitive part of this cone of learning in terms of if we just hear something or read it, we're less likely to uh, remember it into the future and less likely is less likely to stick. Uh, the stickability of this sort of information learning comes when we have to implement it and we're doing hands-on problem solving or simulating something or doing the real thing. And what we're doing in our educational escape room space is in this bottom section where we're doing things and collaboratively problem solving together and helping each other learn in that sort of regard. So that's what we're aiming for. And that's the sort of learning that we're trying to get, this active, hands-on, problem-solving based learning. And I guess we've got three goals that we're trying to aim for in this sort of escape room based learning space. Now, one of them is to engage students in this fun and engaging way where rather than students turning up because they have to, I want them to turn up and want to learn. And so we're transforming this intrinsic motivation where they actually want to come and they want to learn. Uh, the second part is collaborative, collaborative problem solving. And uh, I'm an engineer and an engineering professor. One of the things that we need to do within our accreditation is show that we can get students to collaborate together and work together in teams. And so it's not just part of our accreditation, it's beyond that and wider than that to get students working collaboratively and helping each other learn. And then finally, we're looking at trying to apply that knowledge to real life problems. And there's a whole lot of problems in those different circumstances that we could apply our theoretical knowledge to. Well, what are escape rooms then? Um, in the reactions um, menu, please give me a thumbs up if you've done an escape room before. Talking about a recreational escape room primarily, that's because uh, what you've probably done already. But escape rooms are essentially a worldwide, well, let's call them a craze. They started in about 2007 in Japan. And the basic idea is you get a bunch of people, you lock them in a room. You don't physically lock them in a room because that's a bit dangerous. Um, there's fire hazards and things like that. But they're locked in a room metaphorically. There's a theme around the room and they need to solve a series of puzzles to try and escape from that room. They collaborate together to do so. And there's a time limit associated with it as well, typically an hour. Um, now, these have been shown that they're great for teamwork. They're great for that problem solving. And they're really just great fun activities as well. People do them for all different reasons. Well, let's look at escape rooms for education then, because most of us don't have a whole lot of little rooms that we can lock students in, as much as locking students in a room with a textbook until they can learn something might be um, appealing to some of us at some points in time, especially when we're tearing our hair out. But no, we don't have lots of little rooms. And so what we do is we run what we call tabletop escape rooms, where we have groups of three or four students in the one room working around small tables in small groups and solving all of these puzzles. Uh, our puzzles, we normally put in sealed envelopes. And we'll get to those puzzles in a moment. But basically within these educational escape rooms, we've got three elements to them. And you'll experience these three elements if you do the event next Friday with us. Now, one of them is a narrative or theme that binds the whole activity together. 
And the theme's really up to your imagination and creativity. There's a whole bunch of things you could tease out there. Uh, the next, and that's what actually makes it a game as well, because otherwise it's just a whole series of problem solving tasks. And although we do that, well, we're trying to make aging and lifting that intrinsic motivation. Uh, the next part is the puzzles themselves. And this is where the learning is actually taking place as students are solving puzzles and helping each other solve these particular puzzles. And the final thing is the students need to know if they got the answer right, the puzzle right, or if they got it wrong. And so we need some way of actually validating the student feedback and whether they've got it right or wrong. So let's address each of those parts in turn, first looking at the narrative or theme. Um, we're wanting our activities to be fun and immersive. And so we have this storyline around there that we use to kind of set the scene of what's going on. And we've had all sorts of storylines, a few example ones. You could have things like earthquake cave-ins. We've had superhero ones. Um, our most recent one, I'll show you some, some clips from later on, um, is at Brain Enterprises, which is a superhero tech firm. We're using that to teach cybersecurity. Uh, we've had a Star Wars themed one. It's really basically up to your imagination. And I'll show a few samples in a moment. Um, and one of the things we do is we try and make it a bit progressive so that as you progress through the puzzles, a bit more of that theme comes out and we actually reveal a bit more of that theme and help people step through that theme. It, it kind of ties the puzzles and the theme together a bit more closely. Now, there's lots of different ways you can present that theme. You can do it in a written way. And so I've written a lot of storylines and themes around that. And you can even use things like ChatGPT to help generate some of those storylines and themes. It does a, a reasonable job. You'll need a bit of tailoring. We've also done some video-based ones. You can also do things like 360-degree videos where you put on goggles and things like that just to make it a bit more realistic and uh, give a bit more feeling and immersion into the activity. And they could also be set in an industry sort of environment. And so we've done some in the past uh, where we're looking at sabotage within an industry environment or something like that, where it might equip students better for that hands-on uh, practice-based learning, the sort of thing they'll be doing in their careers. Um, here's one sample theme that gives you a bit of a picture of what one of these written themes might look like. Uh, let me read it out. And I normally at the start of these escape rooms read it out to give students an a ample um, experience of everyone get the same sort of experience, but also read it in a way which is engaging. So the students actually want to be, engage in it. Um, so this is one that we actually use for our high schoolers to engage high schoolers in engineering and STEM more generally. The year is 2065. Hello, Right. And you're part of the key command crew on the space cruiser Nebula One. After three months of intense hyperdrive travel, you're just performing the final docking maneuvers into the space station Enoch Alpha. You press the button to open the airlock and board the space station, but nothing happens. Seconds later, a message pops up on your screen. Greetings, traveler. Due to increased attacks from space pirates who have recently implemented a new boarding procedure. You need to verify your identity as graduates of the Intergalactic Training Academy. We'll test you across some fundamental areas of gearing, electronics, and cryptography, which no space pirate has yet been able to master. If you can solve these puzzles, we'll let you on board. If not, we hope you enjoy deep space. You only have 30 minutes, and just to jog your memory, we'll provide a clue every five minutes if you get stuck. You can only complete the puzzles one at a time, and the first one will be beamed down to you now as envelope number one. So you see, we're, we're kind of setting the theme, why they need to escape, how much time they've got to escape, and, and all of those things. They get, as they solve each of those puzzles, a bit more of the storyline, a, a bit of a congratulation and a slap on the back, but also, a oh, there's a bit of tension here because our time's starting to tick down and maybe a few clues to help into the next one. I've listed another storyline there. This is one of our superhero-themed ones where... We've got Mr. Wayne, who's currently away for a joyride to the moon with Elon Musk. And we're trying to apprehend this notorious villain that's wreaking havoc on the world. Um, I won't read this one out. You can read that in your own time. Or if you print screen it and save a copy of it, I'm more than happy for you to do that. I'm more than happy for these slides to be shared later on as well. So you can take a look there. But one thing I came across recently was someone that came across a nice schema or a nice 
uh, outline of a whole lot of different themes that escape rooms generally fall into. And they normally fall into these six categories of an imprisonment where you need to escape something like a dungeon or a bunker or something like that, a disaster where you need to fix something, a heist where you need to steal something, either like information or jewels or something like that, an investigation where you need to solve a particular mystery, a quest where you need to follow something, or a test where you need to win something and, and beat others in winning. And in terms of creating this theme and an immersive environment, a key question that's worth asking is, who was in this space before the players and why is why are these puzzles actually here? Why are they lock things up? And that helps actually tie the puzzles together with this theme and makes them a cohesive fit rather than a bunch of random puzzles and some sort of storyline that doesn't relate at all. Having them fit together makes it more of a game and makes this immersion stronger. Well, let's jump to the puzzles now. And what we normally do is put each of these puzzles in a sealed envelope. You can see I've got a bunch of sealed envelopes there. Now, we normally have three in the escape rooms I run. That's a bit of an arbitrary number. We could have more, but the way I've set up everything with the decoder boxes and things like that, we have three puzzles and we have each of those puzzles in a separate sealed envelope. Now, the, the participants need to solve the puzzles and in solving the puzzles, they each have a series of uh, numbers that are generated, and they also need to know the order that those numbers are going to be in. So they solve what the numbers are and the order of those particular numbers. Now, I've got a website up there. I didn't develop that website, but decode.fr slash em is a great website for ciphers and puzzles. They've got hundreds of different puzzle generators and ciphers in there. Okay, well, how do we then validate the solutions that everyone's putting in? There's a number of different ways we could do that. Uh, I'll discuss some of them. Now, it's something that I've actually invented. Uh, here's a pic oh, here's the, the physical representation of what it looks like. There's a bunch of electronics inside there, and that electronics allows us to just one moment. That electronics allows us to um, do a few things. We've got a slight frozen, frozen screen, or is it just my screen? No, it's think, happened here uh, as well. Here yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, so just, pop, um, just give Rob a bit of a chance to just come back online as well. I was just about to entertain everyone and showcase his um, decoder box as well, which has, I don't want to steal his thunder, but uh, there's quite a lot of analytics that goes in there as well that gets recorded in there that we could use for um, understanding how students um, interact. My apologies, don't you hate it when your internet just drops out mid-presentation, especially when you're the one presenting. <laughs> Let me get those slides back up for everyone. And this is where we're up to. Um, we also have automated clue delivery because we don't want people to get stuck and unable to solve the particular puzzles that they're dealing with. So every five minutes, you can turn this on or off, it'll actually give the participants one of the answers. Um, one digit in that answer. It will never give them the last one though. Uh, it has a countdown timer so they can see how much time they've got remaining. And it also has built-in data analytics, which is really helpful if you're publishing in this area. And I've published about 10 papers in this area because you can show um, based on student surveys, but also on how long they took to solve each of these puzzles and how many wrong guesses they made for each of these puzzles, a, a different dimension to evaluating qualitatively what's going on. So that, that should be quantitatively rather. Um, we also have a bunch of ways we can um, set up these decoder boxes. And basically I've developed this very simple script here. And all you need to do is specify what each of the codes are. So code one is 14125, for example, you put all the numbers in. 
you tick whether you want clues delivered or not. You select your game time, like 25 minutes. Or normally I run more like 50 minutes for my ones that I do with my undergraduate or master's students and the penalty time. Normally we leave that at one minute for those undergraduate or master's students. With high schoolers, I often turn that to zero just to encourage them in the activity to give it a go. Now, one question I get a lot is, well, isn't there an app that basically does that sort of thing? Or can we just do it virtually? And the answer is yes, but realistically, the, the game experience in person where people can write together and they can scribble on the bits of paper and they can, they can actually directly communicate with each other uh, is a lot better and a lot stronger. And it sells that, uh, that, that game experience a whole lot better. Um, I've done during COVID uh, a whole lot of games that have been online with students and the, they've taken a lot longer, typically 25% slower. The communication between different students has been more difficult and some students kind of tuned out to it a bit more. Whereas in person, uh, you've got a whole lot more going in terms of student engagement and strongly engaging with the activity. Having said that, there are a bunch of online interfaces. There's a few of them. And those online interfaces from things simple like Google Forms through to things more advanced like the escape one, allow people to create their own online escape rooms. Um, here's one of the views of that particular escape app one where you can have multiple escape rooms and you can schedule them for different times during the day or the week. Uh, and you can have groups and you can do back end other analytics as well. Well, what I thought I'd do is give you a bit of a demo of an escape room that we use for high school. Now, obviously, we're not all sitting in the same room around tables where we've got these boxes ticking away on the tables for us. So the experience is going to be a little bit different. Um, but I'll be showing you mainly the puzzles and the, the sort of narrative that we use around this so you get a bit of an idea about it. So crash. That was the noise of an enormous stone door crashing down behind you, sealing you in. For years, you've been searching for the legendary Aztec cave of gold, and your research and travels have finally led you here, only to be trapped in the cave and having triggered the tripwire for the door. In the corner, you see an enormous egg timer with what, what looks like about 25 minutes of sand remaining. Who knows what will happen when the time's up? Maybe the cave will be flooded out, or maybe we'll even cave in. How do we get out of this one, you ask your compatriots. The legends allude to some sort of vague puzzle cave claiming only the master puzzler is worthy of the gold. One of your merry crew suggests you press on to look for some puzzles. Open envelope number one, solve the first puzzle, enter the code into the decoder box, don't open the next puzzle until the current puzzle is solved. Now here's the first puzzle. This one we aim an audience around year eight, nine, ten sort of uh, age group. Um, so we've got a bit of text there. You approach the first puzzle. It looks a bit like a confused kid's playground. A whole bunch of seesaws with the axle in all different spots. Each seesaw has a weight on one end. At the edge of the cavern, a pile of weights has been dumped. An inscription on the wall reads, bring balance to the world, alas, to the one who tips the scales over. So the idea is we need to work out what each of the weights are going to be for that question mark. We put them in order based on the numbers down the side there, one, two, three, and four. And that's basically the number that we need to progress through this puzzle. So I'll give you a minute or two to read through that, try and work out what the weights are. Um, the little clue to get these in equilibrium is um, the weight times the distance on one side is equal to the weight times the distance on the other side. So the first one, uh, five times one is equal to five times, what's the missing number? Well, it's going to be a one. Um, so I'll give you a minute or two to think through that, solve it. If, you, if you've solved it, stick the answer in the chat window, uh, and then we'll go on to the next puzzle. Normally, students would take somewhere between seven to maybe eight, eight or nine minutes to solve this one. But we don't have quite that much time for us today. Okay, I can see a few different answers in the chat window. Uh, 14125 is looking pretty good. So if that's what you wrote down, or if that's what you're thinking about writing down, you've done well. 
Okay, let's move on to the next one. Well done. You've achieved balance and caused a new passageway to be opened. In this passage, you see a series of clay buckets with connecting channels and the inscription, the key bucket will be the first to fill. You've almost run out of water, so you can't tip your own water supply to test it out. Time to use your mind. So this was an adaptation of a popular puzzle that did the rounds on uh, Facebook a while ago. Uh, but basically, you need to work out which of these buckets or containers will be the first one to fill for each of these. I'll turn off my video so I jump out of the way for a moment so you can see the last one. But once again, stick your answer in the chat window once you've worked out which of those buckets will be the first to fill. And make a careful note that some of them have a bit blocked off on them. So they might not have water going into the next bucket. Okay, we've got a bunch of answers starting to flood in, which are looking pretty much the same. There's 725, uh, and that's the answer. At least that's the answer I get. Okay, our final one, and I won't put you through this one. This is a logic puzzle. Uh, this particular one gets students to do some deductive reasoning where they're trying to work out which of those particular answers or which of these particular numbers it is and which order they're in. So it's a bit like a mastermind sort of thing. Um, but I'll leave this. If you want to take a screenshot of that one, you can solve it in your own time. But bit, fun bit of deductive reasoning there and get some really thinking and doing some logical elimination. Um, we also have at the end of that a bit of an outro or um, a, a conclusion to the activity so that it's not just a bunch of puzzles that are sitting nowhere, but they actually conclude the activity and, and realize, oh, oh, I've actually solved something. And they've got the gold at the end of the day and managed to escape um, with their team intact. So uh, concludes it nicely. Well, what I thought I'd do then is uh, move from the high school range into the university range and show you a bunch of different puzzles from a bunch of different sectors that I've worked across and show what they look like and, and how they're used. And I've classified them a bit based on the sort of puzzle that they are. So these first few are mathematically based puzzles. Uh, one of them, the one on our on our left there, is around uh, transmission of uh, electrical signals from telecommunications towers and working out the, the path loss between different communication systems at different frequencies and uh, different antenna gains. So they're using formulas that they know and applying them to a real life solution. And the one just behind me is one I've partnered with a biochemist to develop and they're working out the required volume to reach those different concentrations of different reagents for a particular solution that they're working with. Uh, this one I've done for, with some water engineers and it's around looking at a different, a bunch of different water tanks and matching those to different profiles based on the demand of those water tanks, how water flows into those water tanks and water flows out of those water tanks. And those different shapes and sizes will result in different profiles. Um, here's a physical reasoning based one where this is one that we actually use with high schools as well, where they need to reason what direction each of these gears actually turn. And once they reason the direction of each of those gears and draw a little arrow on each of those gears, they can use the key extractor and work out what code that relates to one through the nine. To make this a bit more interactive and fun, I've actually 3D printed a bunch of gears and we give these gears to students. And some of these gear trains also include belt drives as well. So they're not all just interlocking gears. And in doing so, they can actually physically reason out, oh, if we turn the gears together, they re reverse direction. And if we have a belt, they stay the same direction. All of those sort of things are possible with that. Um, my main area of expertise before I got into robotics was in uh, electronics. And so we've got a bunch of different circuit puzzles through to looking at different circuit paths, through to resistor color codes, through to 
uh, resistors in series and parallel and Ohm's law and voltage dividers and all those sort of things are possible and take quite well to this sort of environment. We also try and do things not just on paper, but in real life. And these two puzzles here are a demonstration of that. Uh, so our puzzle on our left is one that students actually use their multimeter. And there's different voltages on each of these pins. Um, different pins are connected to different pins and they need to use a multimeter and work out which ones are connected to different ones. Uh, different um, resistances are on some of those pins as well. And so they're using their multimeter in a whole lot of different settings to do that. And the one just behind me here in red is where they're using their oscilloscope and testing things like peak-to-peak -peak voltages and phase shifts and uh, looking at the periods of each of these signals. Uh, so we're teaching all this test equipment in a really fun and engaging way that the students enjoy. Another way we can encode things with puzzles, where they be the puzzles themselves or even clues around the puzzles, is use something we call obfuscation or just making it difficult to read. Now, these I all generated on that website I showed you earlier on, the, the decode website. And it could be uh, back to front writing, like the, the top one there, the Da Vinci writing, or reversing letters in some text, or making the text go upside down. Or even they have a number of um, translators that put it in a, a different accent. So that last one's the, the German accent translator, uh, the largest country in the world by landmass uh, would be the one there. So that's more of a geography based one. Uh, but as I said, they've got hundreds of different puzzles and cipher systems that you could use. Uh, we also do things where we've got things hidden within a scene. So the one at the top is one that we've used for OCH health and safety. And you're looking for different parts within that scene, like having ladders balancing on stairs or having uh, tripping hazards on those stairs, all sorts of things that you don't want to see in an OCH health and safety environment. And this one just behind me, is a coding one because I teach coding and here they're looking for the error in each of these lines of code. Um, so on the, the left one, the error is on line five because they're missing a semicolon after A plus equals two. Uh, on the one just behind me, the error is on line six where they've actually spelled checksum differently because in line one and five, they spelled it with a capital S. In line six, they've spelled it with a lowercase s. And our students have really enjoyed these activities because it's actually, they've actually seen in their own code that, oh, I can actually debug my own code better now because I've seen it and debugged this particular code. Um, there's a whole bunch of different ciphers that are available. And we've created a whole bunch of different, for example, Caesar ciphers and things where you've got wheels that turn through to pig pen ciphers, which is this cipher here where each of these shapes relates to a different letter through to making ciphers have things, for example, that appear on our oscilloscope screens. And so this is some data from a telecommunications engineering course that's been read off uh, a piece of wire. And in reading that data, they can work out what the what message is being sent. And it actually spells out a, a number. It might be eight, E-I-G-H-T, for example. Uh, another way we can do things is in classification. And the most recent escape room that I've been working on uh, with Leanne in this case has been around classifying things in cybersecurity. Uh, these particular ones have been getting students to classify the differences between uh, phishing emails and non-phishing emails and social engineering and not social engineering, all those sort of things that students are delving into these puzzles deeply and, and using some logical reasoning about, oh, are they trying to do a phishing attack here or is this one safe? And at the end of the exercise, I'll, I'll show a brief promo video that we put together that goes for a, a minute and a half or so that talks about what this activity is. And you get to see some video clips of what it actually looks like in practice. And we also have some puzzles around things like spatial reasoning. And this particular one we use with our large cohort of international students to get them a bit more acquainted with Australia, how big it is and what it looks like and things like that. So the first part of the puzzle, there's a bit of obfuscation where they're trying to uh, unscramble these place names and work out where they are. Um, if, you're, if you're good at unscrambling things, feel free to put those in the meeting chat about what these different place names are. Then they actually look at them on the map and work out what is the distance between dif those different place names. And when they've worked out the distance between those different place names, they can actually work out, oh, Actually, Australia is a pretty big place. And oh, now I know where Sydney is and Canberra is and Perth is. 
and a bunch of those different things. And I see a few names um, popping up there uh, and you're doing well at unscrambling those particular ones. So well done. Um, before this activity, I wonder if a number of us knew where all these place names were. Uh, some of them are obvious, but some of them like, oh, maybe B Birdsville or Mount Isa or something like that. We might be, we might struggle a bit more at trying to place those exactly on a map. Um, here's another escape room that I've done recently on measurement systems. And in this particular one, it combines a few different things. So there's a bit of obfuscation with this pig pen cipher where they need to work out what this pig pen cipher says. And then they've got a bunch of calculations that they need to actually work out what those calculations are and uh, compute a line of best fit through them. And then the, the pig pen cipher, when they decode this data, it says, well, you need to work out what the total weight is based on adding together all these individual weights that have been done. Uh, here's another one here, which is actually the next puzzle after that previous one in this measurement escape room. And this particular one, they're using a particular sensor. This is an ultrasonic style sensor. And that ultrasonic sensor, basically, uh, it sends out an ultrasonic signal, a high frequency signal. It bounces off an object and they get it back and it takes a certain amount of time. And based on the speed of sound, they can actually work out how far an object is away. Now, in this case, the the, the ceiling is caving in on them. It's a bit like um, one of those Star Wars episodes where the walls are closing in on that big compactor. And they need to work out what rate the ceiling is closing in on them to escape. So, well, talking about puzzles, it's nice to have a bit of a checklist about these puzzles. and. One of the things I've found with developing these puzzles, and as I said, I've developed about 20 escape rooms. So six... There's a few traps in terms of developing puzzles, particularly for the novice puzzle developer. And the first one is about how difficult the puzzle actually is. It might be too cryptic or use knowledge that only the puzzle generator actually has. And so uh, one thing that we do is do plenty of play testing and get other people who weren't involved in developing the puzzles to try and solve the puzzles to make sure that they're possible to solve. We need to think that, well, is there only one correct solution? And it, does it actually blend with the theme or is it just a puzzle that has nothing to do with the superheroes or the zombies or whatever else is happening in? Uh, some of the blending can be around how we present the puzzle. But some of the bit blending can actually fit in with what the puzzle's actually about. We also have to think about, is the puzzle robust? Or if it's something that's physical, like a, a decoder disk or something like that, is it going to break the first time the students use it? Because that's a bit, well, the experience in doing that isn't as great. Uh, it's also a question of, is this puzzle fun or is it just starting to get so repetitive and annoying? And I've developed escape rooms, um, recreational escape rooms as well in full blown rooms where one of the puzzles we developed was around um, Morse code. And the Morse code puzzle, if they missed a digit in there, they had to go right back to the start and listen from the start. And it just got a bit annoying. It was just too long. And the final reminder there, and I've said it already, so I will say it again, is plenty of play testing is required for these sort of things. Well, I also have a bit of a checklist around running the actual escape room as well. Uh, the first thing is to bring space to the classroom because uh, there's been a few times where despite my best efforts, a piece of paper in one of these puzzles has fallen on the floor and gone missing or something like that. And so having a spare of the puzzle, so at least one spare for your classroom to make sure that if something goes missing or a student inadvertently loses something, uh, they know and they can find it. Um, Another thing is uh, the way we turn these decoder boxes on is there's a little key. So we turn on the key and we take the key out. And the reason we take the key out is so the students can't reset the time because every time you turn it on and off, it actually resets the time. So that's a, a great thing to do as well. Um, oh, there's been a comment about getting dressed up too for the escape rooms. Well, I've got security outfits. I've been the head of security before for certain things. Uh, for one team that I've, um, I've worked with, there's been a, a Jurassic Park styled escape room. They didn't call it that. I've encouraged them to get dinosaur suits and dress up in a dinosaur and have a dinosaur running around the classroom as well to add in that immersion aspect for it as well. Now, most of our puzzles are 
uh, based on paper. So we encourage students to write on that paper and only work on one puzzle at a time. So they're focusing their attention on that particular one at a time. And the final thing that we tell students is make sure when you're getting everything out of the escape room, uh, out of the, the envelope, is that you actually get everything out of the envelope because there's been at least half a dozen times where students have been stuck. They just haven't been able to solve a puzzle. And I've put, picked up the envelope, turned it upside down, and the last piece of the puzzle has fallen out and they've realized, oh, crap. That made it a whole lot more difficult when something was actually missing. Now, in terms of student feedback, I thought I'd cover some of the, the feedback we've had from students and some of the, the research around this as well. Uh, we've had um, hundreds or, well, thousands of participants through our escape rooms now. Uh, the 1,500, it's significantly more than that these days. And the, the student engagement in them has been really high. Um, in terms of measuring flow and things like that, a lot of students have report they've lost track of time and lost track of awareness of their surroundings and things like that and they've really enjoyed the activity and so you see some of the student responses there we've run these on things like our student open days and you can see a whole bunch of students and uh, family working together on these escape rooms uh, which has been really nice because we've seen them working together in these groups either as peers or as family and solving these puzzles in terms of student motivation uh, we've been asking them things like well how absorbed did you feel in the activity and how much did you actually want to complete this activity? Now, I, I haven't asked my students for a normal classroom when they're sitting down and listening to me give a lecture or something like that. How much do you actually really want to be here? Um, the reason I ask this is maybe I don't want to hear the answer. Um, but when we're asking around these escape rooms, they're really strongly engaged in them. They strongly agree that they want to complete this activity and they're absorbed in the activity. This is something that they're really keen on. Um, in terms of research, this is a growing field. And so the first papers in this area came out around 2015 uh, in terms of educational escape rooms. And if you look, um, they're growing rapidly. And I haven't got the figures for 2021 or for 2022 rather, and 2023 is obviously ongoing. Uh, but it's a, a field that's growing rapidly, including the papers I've been publishing in this area. I thought I'd give you a few of the future research directions that we're looking at in this area and then show you a brief video and then kind of open up the floor to any questions. So a few of the, the future areas that I'm looking at is deploying escape rooms in a whole bunch of different areas, including in robotics areas, in, in first year fundamental electronics, uh, in teaching programming languages and things. Um, one of the new areas we've been getting into is in corporate training and training people specifically in the cybersecurity space. And I'll, I'll show you the promo for that in a moment. Um, in looking at different areas across STEM, but more widely than STEM. I've been working from people with health sciences. Uh, there's people writing escape rooms in history areas. Uh, I'm writing one for geography soon for primary schoolers. Um, we're also looking at doing different interfaces between decoder boxes and padlocks and online interfaces and things. We're looking at doing some physiological modeling and I've got the um, monitoring and looking at the participants' galvanic skin response. So how much stress are they under and things like that. Um, and also getting students to actually write the escape rooms because that's one of those activities which is um, difficult, but it also gets them to apply the knowledge that they have and that they're learning as well. Um, so um, where to from here? Well, feel free to send me an email after this and collaborate further. Um, I'm keen to develop new escape rooms with people. And, and if you want a bit of help at developing escape rooms, I'm more than happy to collaborate in that regard. Um, also, those decoder boxes, they're sold by a, a group called Escape Room Education. Um, uh, full disclosure, my wife actually runs that company. And basically what we did is first we made the decoder boxes open source and they just didn't go anywhere because people didn't have the skills to actually solder them and source all the parts across the world for them. So what we do is we actually solder those together. They're fully uh, assembled and made Australian-owned company uh, and supplied within Australia, and we export them around the world as well. And the idea is that we can put them in people's hands really quickly. Um, and the other thing is you might want to do some training with us as well in terms of the cybersecurity training or come along to the Ask a Light presentation that's happening next week. Okay, there are the slides that are prepared in that. But I've got this brief video that I'd love to show you that shows 
the training associated with it, but also shows how we actually, um, sometimes it's really helpful to engage participants to actually see, well, how can we produce a promo to show them oh, what's coming up next and provide a bit of anticipation around these escape rooms. So I've got a brief video that shows you the sort of things that we can show to students or participants to get them interested in what's coming up. And I may have shared that without pressing the, the sound button. So let me put the sound button on as well. Share sound, that's what we want. Malware, ransomware, identity theft and phishing have led cybercrime to be a trillion dollar a year problem. Cybersecurity is not just for the IT department. It's everyone's responsibility. What if you wake to find out someone has taken out a loan in your name? All your files have been encrypted and held for ransom. Or your personal information has been shared far and wide. In the words of former FBI Director Mueller, there are only two types of companies. Those that have been hacked, and those that will be hacked. How prepared are you for the inevitable? Cybercrime isn't going away anytime soon. The best way to be protected is to be trained. But not all training is created equal. You may have done all online modules, with easy multiple choice questions, which everyone quickly forgets afterwards. You may have been a victim of death by PowerPoint, and wondered when it was all going to end. Escape room training couldn't be more different. Our activities are infused with hands-on problem solving, and collaborative teamwork, to identify threats, and ultimately to understand cybersecurity, as a team. These escape rooms are engaging, fun and where learning is almost inescapable. Contact us today to see how we can equip your team to be your first line of cyber defense. Okay, on that note, I'd love to open the floor to any questions that people may have on escape rooms or game-based learning or anything related to any of those things. Thank you so much, Rob. That that was fantastic. <laughs> and and uh, just as a as a slight reflection, the the code wheels. I'm old enough to remember when you used to get one of those um, with your computer games to stop people copying computer games, and you had to enter the right yeah. code to be able to play the computer game. Um, but maybe I'm just showing my age there. <laughs> All right. Um. So we there are a few questions already in the chat window, and I'll, I'll I'll pass them on to you. But if you've got other questions, please either chuck your hand up, or if you don't want to ask it, you don't want to switch on your camera, please put it in the chat, and I'll put it to Rob. We've got about ten minutes, which is plenty of time for some really good questions. But I'm going to start off um with one of my questions, hey, because I'm I'm the co-host, right? I get to do that, and I want to ask you, Rob, how do you manage um accessibility issues is is that a problem when it comes to escape rooms you know what about students with uh you know visual impairment or students in wheelchairs or all those kinds of things you know yeah that, that's a great question and it's something that we haven't encountered too much although we've had some students um the accessibility issues we've had have been in deafness or loss of hearing and things like that and one of the the interesting dynamics that comes out there is because it's a team-based activity you've got this teamwork aspect to it where students are helping each other out and helping overcome some of those shortcomings that they have. And so sometimes those students haven't been able to hear something or maybe see something or something like that, but maybe they've been able to contribute in a different way that the others haven't. Um, mm. Having said that though, the other thing that I'm actually working on at the moment, one of the escape rooms I didn't mention is one around teaching empathy and disability. And so some of the puzzles that we've got are things like um, uh, related to using a puzzle that's all in braille. And so I've got a braille printer that you actually need to feel and work out what the braille is, where if someone could read braille, they'd, they'd smash out that puzzle much faster than people that couldn't. Um, and we've got sign language puzzles and also puzzles around uh, dyslexia and things like that. So actually understanding a bit uh, in a team and trying to create that empathy there of what different people deal with and how they overcome those challenges. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, no, I really like that idea of people, people's strengths complementing each other. Um, all right, a question from Oriel is, 
with collaboration becoming more important as a graduate outcome, um, how do you assess that with escape rooms? How do you assess that collaboration in escape rooms? Yeah, there's, I guess there's a, a qualitative side and a quantitative side to it. Um, part of the, the qualitative side is that we could observe how well the students are working together uh, and also get them to reflect on how well they've worked together as a group. And so often we'll try and have a debrief at the end of the, the session of, um, we often have surveys at the end of the session, but also how well did you work as a group and what could have you done better to actually work together as a group and solve some of these puzzles? Mm. Um, the quantitative side of it is also, um, we've got all that data analytics there. We can work out how quickly they've solved these puzzles and uh, how many mistakes they've made in those puzzles. And so part of it is groups that work well together and work effectively together will often do better and, and make less wrong guesses. So it's not just a matter of intelligence, but it's also teamwork associated with that. But in some ways, it's a bit difficult to decouple both of those. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, Debbie's question is a little bit related. Um, and and Debbie, if I, if I don't get this right please switch on your your, your mic or your camera and, and correct me um but debbie's asked have you integrated any learning analytics or data collection into the actual escape room itself so not just the post testing but but i guess in the in the the scope of the moment kind of thing yeah so the the data analytics that goes on inside this box is that as the students put their answers in uh it keeps a record of how many incorrect answers or incorrect guesses that they put in and it also keeps a record of how many seconds they've taken to solve each of those puzzles. And so that data analytics, when we plug it into a computer, is pulled out and basically allows us to publish on all that data in terms of comparing puzzles. And you can do some like A-B testing in terms of you give this cohort this puzzle and this cohort this puzzle, and you can compare how they've done in a relative sense to each other. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um Okay. <laughs> um, a few people dashing off to the, the meetings, but I, I'm going to ask just one more question, if that's all right. Um, and you, you've spoken a lot about the value of having physical escape rooms, having people in the room. And, and that's the traditional model of the escape room, I guess, as much as you can have a traditional model for something that's quite new. Um, but what about online escape rooms? Have you designed those and how have you done them differently? Yeah, I've designed a number of online escape rooms and the online escape rooms, I actually um, put together a, a website. Um, let me share my screen so you can see what that actually looks like. Um, those that are doing the session next week uh, will be actually uh, <laughs> doing online escape room. Uh, and basically what I've done is put together a website. You've got a similar sort of interface where you've got a bunch of numbers that you're punching in. And uh, each of those puzzles will pop up on the screen as a PDF document. Now there's a number of different ways that you can uh, run these, but what we've found is that um, students just aren't as engaged. And we normally run them as a Zoom activity. So each of the groups will be in a small breakout room in Zoom and they'll be working together in a small group. And then as a facilitator, I just jump between the different groups and make sure that they're all on the right track and not pulling their hair out too much. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think I think we're running out of time. <laughs> uh, Ariel can remember um, some of my computer game puzzles as well. So it's nice to know I'm not alone. <laughs> but uh, please uh, put your hands together in, in whatever form is best for you uh, to thank uh, Associate Professor Robert Ross for, for coming and talking to us about digital escape rooms. I'm going to hand back to Leanne, who's just going to do a few little adverts about the learning design SIG. Uh, and then I think we're wrapped up. And it's Friday. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for everybody. You, just uh, again, we've said this, just a quick reminder, next week we do have our um, Ask Light Learning Design Hackathon um, hybrid um, held in Melbourne at the, the Trobe University City campus as well. Next week, Friday, between 10 to 10 to 3.30. It's open. It's free for everyone to come along. We, we certainly do have more spaces face-to-face um, -face as well, and we would love to connect and to collaborate with you as well. And if you are um, attending Ascolite, whether um, online or in person, we have a number of um, workshops, seminars, and events that will be there as well. And again, we would love to connect and uh, reflect on the year and also start planning for next year as well. So we would love to collaborate with all of you. But 
But for now, thank you so much to everybody. Special thanks to Robert. Um, and feel free to connect with Robert if you want to collaborate or, um, you know, continue discussions with Rob in the future. Thank you so much. Have a great Friday. Have a great weekend. See everyone shortly. Bye. <laughs> Uh, Leanne, there was a request for slides, so I can...